two arguments. First piece of setup is what are the domestic banks we're talking about? These are just financial institutions that are privatized but likely, likely state regulated. Second of all, what do we mean by encouraging? That's things like decreasing interest rates on your loans. It's things like the government providing subsidies to these financial institutions to do that. It's things like having government-backed insurance against defaults. And it's things like having one-time sign-up fees be extremely low or negligent. But it also means doing things like increasing your marketing of these types of FI so people know they exist. What do we think accounts actually is? I think genuinely it is just microfinance loans. That is international banks that give help uh, you know, to domestic people when they ask for loans. Is there clarifications? No? Cool. All right, first argument. Why do we think this is better for individuals? First thing to establish is why microfinance is just really coercive and really bad and has impacts not just on individuals but also in the jurisdiction in which they operate. And then an explanation of why this option is just so much better for a few reasons. Firstly, why do we think microfinance is really bad? The first thing to say is that people just opt in really badly to this. And that's for a few reasons. Firstly, they often don't understand the punitive extent of the conditions that are offered on these microfinance loans because they are just really lucrative when you are first offered them. And what that means is that people just tend to accidentally indebt themselves, which is really terrible. But the other thing to note about microfinance is often the barrier to entry to receive a microfinance loan is really low. That is, the paperwork is often very small. It means that your credit history often isn't checked. But also there's a huge amount of collective pressure to opt into the system. And that's because often these microfinance companies give out small amounts of money to lots of people in the same jurisdiction. But that's only worthwhile when lots of people in that jurisdiction opt in. So that means that perhaps you encourage your neighbours and friends and family to also take these microfinance loans when they are less financially able to do so, but they feel like they have no choice but to opt in. So that means that you should believe that people opt into microfinance loans in a bad way. Why do we think that these other options are far better? First of all, we note that financial institutions have electoral accountability, which means that when they do really bad things for people who are taking loans from them, are really punitive and punish them and take, put people into a huge amount of debt, they are, that is obviously bad for them electorally, perceptively. But the second thing we would note is that the state gives far better protections to banks that are, that are, that are domestic, and that's because they'll do things like have insurance on deposits, which means that like bank runs are less likely, but also these state run banks are just far, far bigger which means that they have more capital at their disposal to dip into at the point where people default in their loans, which means they're less likely to default to punitive measures on them. But also note they have things like anti-fraud protection that predatory microfinance institutions just do not have. The other reason we think why domestic banks are better is because they are just far more flexible with the way in which they do repayment. And that's because I've explained to you that they have more capital to fall back on. And note that more people entering into these domestic banks means that their level of capital continually increases. Because if you have 100 people versus 50 people, you have double the amount of capital. And that means that if people start to default, you have more money at your disposal to make the impact of that default on the individual better. But the other thing is that microfinance organizations have to attract more investment, which means they do things like delay their write-offs, for example. So instead of writing off someone's loan, instead they will make them pay it back in more and more punitive ways, and they'll do things that are terrible for a few reasons. Firstly, we know the fact that the impact of non-performing loans is terrible because a lot of people that are under financial duress will do everything up, they will pay their loan back first and then focus on other things, which means they're likely to do things like drop their kids out of school so they don't need to pay school fees and they can instead work on their farm, for example. They'll do things like not feed themselves so they can instead pay that loan back to the microfinance organisation. And what that means is that people not only indebt themselves but destroy their own lives because the coercive power of microfinance institutions is so big that they have no choice but to pay that money back to that microfinance organisation and everything else in their life slips away. Obviously, there is also the chance that when you are working with a regular bank, you also have to pay back your loan. Like, that is a chance. You obviously do. But know that the conditions on it are far less punitive for the reasons I've just explained. They have more capital. They are under control by the state. They have a lot of electoral incentives not to be mean. Microfinance organisations that operate outside of the jurisdiction have none of those incentives, and that is where they are far right. worse. But the other thing to note is that the risk of a bank run on a microfinance organisation is far worse, which means what they're likely to do when they're desperate for capital is just seize all of your land, for example, because often your microfinance loans are collateralised by your land, which means that they'll just take it away from you. So not only do you lose all of your life savings that is in that microfinance institution, but you also lose your one asset, which is likely your property, which notably for a lot of these individuals in developing countries is also where their income is attached to. So not only do they lose their land, but they also lose any ability to gain any meaningful wages, and that is obviously terrible. And that pressure just is not symmetric on domestic banks, because bank runs are far easier to deal with as a domestic bank when you have things like backed insurance by the government, when you have things like more capital, and when you have electoral incentives to prevent those things from happening in the first place. 
Secondly, why do we think it's better for the individual, oh sorry, better for developing countries? Closing, what have you got? Um, aren't microfinance institutions regulated by wherever they're located? Yeah, sure, but the regulation is dog shit on microfinance organisations. It's so easy for them to pass any of those regulations. But also, even if they're regulated, they have incentives to be bad actors because the way that microfinance organisations generate money is literally putting people in debt. Like they give you $100 and your interest rate is 50%. When you as an individual can't pay it back, then 75%. That's how they get people into the trap. So regulation can be great, that's your extension, sure. But the regulation is shit when the organisation itself is coercive and manipulative. Second of all, why do you think this is better for developing countries? The first thing to explain is why they need their own individual financial institutions. And the second thing to explain is why this is the best way to develop them. Firstly, why do they need their own FIs? The first thing is it makes them far more financially dependent, and that's for a few reasons. One, it means you can internalise and formalise your domestic financial operations, which means that people are more likely to operate your domestic currency, for example, which likely means that your exchange rate increases, which also means that the value of your goods increase, because note that when more people are operating your currency, it means that more people are likely to buy your goods and services, and that in turn has flow impacts to you. Secondly, country companies are more likely to do FDI in your country at the point where you have a stable financial institution. That's because they feel like they can rely on you, they can depend on you, and you're a place worth investing in. Note that developing countries, empirically, that have stronger FIs are the ones that are more likely to receive FDI. But we'd also know that so many countries that have had devaluation issues, like Turkey and like Argentina, are the ones that have the weakest FIs. At the point where more people invest into domestic banks, those FIs are made better, they are made more secure, and that means that likely the economy is also better. But second of all, note that when more people opt into them, it improves the stability of the banks for everyone. Because at the point where they have more liquidity, that means they're likely to be more secure. Why do I think this is the best way to develop them? Is what I've just pointed out, which is that when you have more domestic people operating in that bank, it's more stable, it has more capital, and the government is more incentivized to help at the point where more of their constituents are invested in that financial institution. But also they have access to things like data, which is super useful. So at the end of the issue, we believe that reliance on Western microfinance institutions is just terrible for these countries, but also for individuals who are bankrupt and indebted in huge amounts of loans, which is terrible for them and for their families. Proud to govern. Thank PM for that speech. I invite Ello to begin the op bench. Here, here. We are not going to spend our entire case on the kind of counter-narrative that was pushed on us by that Prime Minister Speaker of the worst forms of microfinance. Instead, we will tackle the other aspect of this topic first, and that is the idea that instead of focusing on domestic banks, we would focus on international ones instead, we would encourage them to set up. And the primary push on why we would do that is that alongside PM, if you listen to that speech, she suggests that what the burden should be, the person that should bear the burden of setting up domestic banks, should be individuals who are giving those banks money and taking on credit products from them. They should take on the risk of those banks failing or not failing, mishandling or not mishandling, being predatory or not being predatory. We don't think that that's reasonable at all on side hello. Instead, what we would do is we would say that the person who should, and actors that are best suited to start to do the things that could lead to the development of a strong domestic banking sector would be international banks who can come in and do things like upskill people, provide the underwriting and credit protection services they would do publicly. We would get that to be done privately by institutions like HSBC and other types of large international banks. I will deal with microfinance at the end, but I think international banks as a comparative is a far more interesting and far better debate, certainly more favorable for us. So let's talk about what we would heavily encourage. International sources of credit, we would use our fiat in a few different ways. The first one would be we would encourage people to go for international banks that offer credit services instead of domestic ones. But the second thing we would do, and probably the more compelling one, because I think international banks are pretty appealing as offers, offers or creditors of credit services already, is we would heavily encourage those banks to come and sign. We would offer them things like favorable tax regimes. We would do things like lobby them to come and set up branches in our country. We would do things like assure them that we will give them the space that they need to build a bank branch. We would subsidize them if they wanted to set up bank branches in more rural areas or areas where it might not otherwise be financially viable. Why is that incredibly good and incredibly powerful? The first thing to say here is that these are institutions that are very, very large. They have access to international credit, and they have access to international oversight as well, which means that these domestic governments don't have to do all of the work of surveilling them, all of the work of regulating them. 
Because that regulation can happen through things like global oversight, global regulation, and just global investment forces. For instance, if HSBC sets up in Sri Lanka, starts doing really dodgy, bad shit, it's possible that that is going to be determined going to be discovered by these shareholders of HSBC who will respond by selling the shares because they realize that that is a financial risk. That's something that that bank responds to automatically and it doesn't even require government fiat. Incredibly valuable to have this type of thing. The second thing is that obviously we would to an extent encourage informal lending as well. Probably not so much microfinance, although to an extent we think it's necessary. Obviously we would regulate it to be sure it is as unpredatory as possibly can be. But the second thing is that in rural areas where there is not access to banks, people still need credit and they have really compelling reasons for needing it. They access that credit in really bad ways. Often that looks like relying on things like traditional village patriarchal or power structures, going to the local elder or the local leader and taking credit from them. The problem here though is that because this is strictly informal, the only way to enforce those debts is through things like informal justice as well. What we would do, another thing that we would do with our fiat, is we would also engage in outreach for these types of systems and those local leaders. We would connect them to more formal institutions. So for instance, ensuring that they understand how to do things like write contracts, which means that instead of relying on mob justice or village justice, they would rely on legal justice to recover their debts. We would also connect them to things like international banks, and we would allow them to do things like accessing corporation as well, so they can hopefully access things like insurance and make those lending schemes much more formal. That is actually a much more bottom-up, compelling way to build the start of a healthy domestic bank industry, and one that's likely to be more competitive. It's likely to see those initial bank branches forming in many different areas of the country all at once. How wonderful is that? Take it to the uh, What fear? This is that this house believes that they should motion. You don't have any fear, neither does OG. This house believes that they should motions, but has the word shouldn't. That's so it is a debate that has fiat in it. You can check the world's opinion for that. So let's talk firstly about why domestic banks are not particularly good, and in fact encouraging people to invest in them is even worse. The first thing to say here is that this debate only really matters in context where there is a problem for those domestic banks and attracting creditors, which intuitively suggests that they must be doing something people don't really like. The second thing to say here is that we will name a bunch of problems. For instance, in context where currencies are really unstable, that means that the value of bonds, which is the safest asset that most banks overwhelmingly purchase, those bonds fluctuate in value really dramatically as well, because bonds are kind of like, uh, it's basically uh, like if currency inflates really aggressively, that means that the bonds deflate in terms of their relative value as compared to investing just directly in currency. That means that the assets of those banks in those countries can be really volatile. International banks, by contrast, are more likely to have access to purchasing foreign bonds from more stable countries balance their assets and obviously can invest in many different ways, have more access to capital broadly, and more access to things like banking insurance and private industry. The Why? second thing is that there's often really bad regulation and there's corruption happening in this context, which means that it's very hard to regulate those domestic banks. Sometimes they just invest in fundamentally bad assets because they were bribed to do so, or because of other patronage networks that encourage them to finance just poor construction projects that never end up succeeding. Often they have a lack of resources and a lack of access to things like insurance as well. That's incredibly bad because it means that when those domestic banks fail, it's only the government that is capable of bailing them out if you don't have a strong second level of larger international banks in that country. Why is encouraging make this worse? Firstly, it means that those banks are more likely to accept higher risk individual creditors that otherwise they would not have, would not have gone to them in the first place, which makes them even more volatile. The second thing to say is that this also means that you get a kind of drain, I guess, on the government, because to the extent that you do do things like insure deposits, when people do engage in bank runs in those contexts, it's the government that bears the cost, there's no other actor. By contrast, when you do things like encourage and subsidize international banks to come and step in, those banks can do two things that are critical to stabilize domestic banks. The first one is that they can insure those domestic banks and invest in them. They would like to do so as part of their portfolio. We would probably make it, and that would be a good thing. And if those banks then do go under, that's all right. Those large international institutions balance the risk. They have actuaries. They can probably cope. But the second thing to say is that when those banks fail, instead of needing to bail them out, often then what those domestic governments can do is allow those domestic banks to be purchased by the international bank, who's able to then uh, meet the obligations, the debt obligations of that domestic bank, fulfill them, and that means that everyone gets to keep their deposit in that domestic bank as well. So instead of the government, which is cash strapped, having to take that on, instead there are international actors that are likely to see this as a good opportunity to continue to invest in a country that has already given them, fav given them favorable treatment. Which means they're able to just completely offset that risk entirely and put it on an actor that we think also, like, arguably has a moral duty to do this, but also certainly has kind of commercial incentives to do so, especially when we use our fiat in this particular way. So why is this really, really good? The first thing to say here is that when you set up those international organizations, they're likely to give people better deals at more favorable rates, they're more likely to have high levels of expertise, and they also help to grow the domestic expertise as well. So people go and work for HSBC, they learn the heaps and heaps, then they go and they work for a domestic bank, and they learn what they, they take what they've learned as well. They might even found their own bank, so that is incredibly useful. 
Let's finally deal with those informal things. One, obviously the worst forms of microfinance and worst forms of NGOs that do have things like histories of being predatory, we would ban. That's fine. The second thing to say, though, is that we do think capital is necessary in isolated areas that can't sustain a bank branch. That looks like people needing to invest in better machinery for their farms, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. We would make sure to try to formalize and encourage people to continue to use those systems. We'd make them stronger and more resilient. That means people can continue to develop economically in those areas as well. This is probably the only way that you can reach those people very easily. Cambodia at the moment is going through a crisis of non-performing loans and microfinance, with waves of homes being seized, and literally a startling drop in high school uh, uh, enrollments, simply because people begin to pull their children out of school in order to pay loans. This is a crisis that absolutely crept up as COVID hammered a shadow banking sector that literally had no transparency and had no forms for government protection. This is the type of travesty that doesn't occur because of international banks, which just simply don't make up the vast majority of the banks in the developing world. Winning, it is countries like Indonesia, where in the wake of the Asian financial crisis, there was a sudden collapse of a number of shadow banking lenders, which meant they literally just had to recall their loans and rapidly liquidate in order to pay off their creditors, which all of a sudden meant a whole bunch of people lost their homes. Winning, these are the types of international tragedies which deserve more response from side opposition. I'm going to start with their analysis on international banks, and I think there's two problems with this argument. First is it's just deeply improbable. Empirically, there is a reason why microfinance exists in the first place. It's because international banking has systematically failed. They've failed to significantly provide any meaningful forms of loans other than in major capital cities and urban centres in developing nations. That is why over 90% or something or other of Cambodia accesses microfinance rather than any form of international bank. And even if you didn't believe that, I think to the extent that they do exist, they are structurally inaccessible and cater to few people. And that is simply because they are unwilling to take the risk to set up financial instruments into rural Cambodia. For what profit incentive? They're making so much money from a single person in any developed nation that is far wealthier. I just don't understand. They haven't proven any likelihood on why international banks would operate in this way. But even if they could prove that likelihood, international banks are terrible for all the reasons that Bella described in her speech to no response. Explain to me, why do you want your country to be more dependent on transacting in US dollars because no international bank is going to transact in whatever your local currency is and do a whole bunch of currency exchange conversions and incur a whole bunch of risk for no apparent benefit. No, but also, even if this wasn't a significant harm, why do you want a big international Western bank all of a sudden being the key and only bank that is providing financial services to your whole country? Maybe that would make me a little bit scared that maybe this Western nation all of a sudden has far too much leverage to be able to weaponize, for instance, its regulation over those banks to, for instance, put pressure on your nation to give up certain light rights licenses to your natural resources because they simply have so much control over your country. We think one of the terrible uh, things of colonial history is that so many nations became dependent on the, uh, the institutions of their colonial state, which made it impossible for them to refuse military bases, impossible for them to refuse other forms of companies exploiting their resources. But even if you didn't believe that, why do you want an international bank which is not transparent or held to account by the domestic government when they cannot access the books and the data which private companies hold as corporate secrets when they are not held electorally to account what incentive do you have to not seize the home of an Ethiopian farmer because you are not the local government that's going to be held electorally accountable you are only held to your uh, like masters in developed countries that are reaping the profits their responses or possible benefits of international banks is they're less likely to go through bank runs. The opposite is overwhelmingly the case. The moment these banks start incurring significant losses, they get the hell out. What are they there for in the first place? 
which means they don't all of a sudden pull their liquidity to try and stabilize the situation. These banks are very risk adverse. Even if they had developing branches, there's a tiny minority of their operations and their profits. So why do you engage in the big risk of having to bail out all these different things when you get such a little return for it? And their response to this is they have so much more money and liquidity, as if developing nations aren't countries still with the entire ability to literally print money on their side. I just don't think it is true that big international banks are willing to leverage half of their balance sheet in supporting some random developing nation and preventing a bank from there. But last year, I actually think that their big supposed benefit of international banks buy up domestic banks has to be one of the worst harms of this debate. Because why on earth would you buy a bank with a whole bunch of debt? That was never the probable circumstance because it's not profitable for international banks to do that. The answer is, why are they buying up this domestic bank? Because they're buying it on pennies on the dime. They know they can extract what little is in this country, be able to collateralize a whole bunch of land, be able to reach some small amounts of money at almost no expense because the nation state is struggling so hard. Meaning that is a problem that we want to avoid in the first place by making our domestic banks as strong, as capable, and as liquid as possible. I'll take your peer on it. Yeah. In the rural areas we're concerned with, it's never going to be economically viable to set up full bank branches that would actually make access happen. In that case, people will still access capital. Surely they will just do it in far worse ways and we don't reach out and encourage people to do it in better ways. That's our case, that we do it in the better ways of domestic bank. Like, developing nations have been experimenting a long time with how to make their domestic banks more accessible. Whether that is online verification to reduce the amount of paperwork, whether that is expanding digital currencies in order to be able to access more rural infrastructure that doesn't have the same type of local branches in their area. Meaning that developing nations are pretty damn good at making sure their domestic banks the best possible reach those type of communities. I do not understand counterfactually why your international banks have any of those same incentives to reach those people. Two additional things I want to prove. First is on the regulation of these microfinance institutions, which comes out in a POI from closing. The problem is here is that, yes, I agree that sometimes microfinance is not necessarily predity, predatory, but it is chronically self-interested. What that means is that they simply, firstly, have very little incentive to be regulated by their developed nation in the first place. Why would the US invest a large amount of its own political capital regulating these banks when its own population is not directly affected by them, particularly because it is shrouded in the public relations nightmare of your regulating loans to developing nations. So you're risking a large amount of controversy and a large amount of political capital for literally no domestic gain. But even when they do regulate these microfinance institutions to some degree of extent, these microfinance institutions don't actually, like, aren't significantly hemmed in by their regulation. Simply because they're self-interested in all they want to do is be able to liquidate certain forms of property in order to retain uh, or reduce the risk of any losses. And because they know there will never be legal prosecution from a developing nation that can't effectively bring it to court, and when they know they can just ultimately get out of these countries if push comes to shove, worst case, I don't think this regulation meaningfully reduces the types of harms that we describe. Because the impact that we explain is that microfinance institutions uniquely have incentives to not write off loans. They need to be able to attract future investors. If they say, look at all these non-performing loans, they cannot get those future investors in the first place. Whereas governments have electoral incentives to be transparent and to ensure that shadow banking does not lead to a financial crisis in their countries. And that is the type of devastation that we avoid only under opening government. Uh, DPM for that speech. I invite DLO to conclude the opening half. Here, here.
each person in a developing country has a different circumstance, and there are a large spectrum of different developing countries. For example, somebody who is in rural China probably has more capacity than someone who is in sub-Saharan Africa to access a formal institution. And the reason why this is important is because they keep trying to push a binary between things like domestic or international banks or domestic banks and microfinance, but realistically, those comparatives don't play out in the way they talk about. For example, they're like, uh, well, microfinance is really bad because it's a really low barrier to entry. So if you have literally no credit, you can borrow from a microfinance institution. But the problem is that the domestic bank on their side does not loan to this person either, right? So if you're someone who is super poor, the like counterfactual for you isn't domestic banks versus international banks. You're going to microfinance on either side because no formal institution will lend money to someone who's zero credit history and has zero transactions on the commercial market, which means these people have to go to things like microfinance and informal lending. And that's the kind of regulation encouragement that we get that is able to regulate the worst harms and excesses of those forms of lending. The second observation to make is that like a lot of their uh, analysis about incentives of all of our alternatives is premised on the idea that we really want to like exploit poor developing countries and that like microfinance and international banks are going to like colonize and liquidate your assets and all that kind of stuff. But this is an incentive that makes no financial sense because as Eugene explains, there's a very low incentive to actually go into developing country in the first place because people are poor, there's you know, a lot of risk and all that kind of stuff, which means that the only reason you want to go is because you're hedging against long-term growth. That means the strategy if I enter a village is not to liquidate someone's slum, like I get no money from liquidating their slum. My profit strategy is like, oh gotcha, you borrowed like five dollars from me, and now I'm taking three dollars off the top of that. Obviously what they want to do is they actually want to see you grow. They want you to start your business and engage in longer term borrowing windows so they can actually make more profit from it and their net profit is higher because obviously in the developed world people already have capital which means that the return you get from somebody growing is very low but in the developing country you make some from rags to riches which means that the percentage of cut you can take is much much higher that is why yes exploitation happens but exploitation happens when you're rich and we're okay with exploiting the rich and those who've already made it so two issues in this debate firstly on alternative forms of credit and then secondly on the impact on domestic banks Firstly, on alternative forms of credit, uh, there are three different broad alternatives. I'm sure Closing can talk about another. That is a very valid contribution. Uh, the first is international banks, the second is microfinance, and the third we'd say is like informal systems of lending. So, firstly, in terms of international banks, Eugene has two responses. The first is just to deny their existence. It's like, they don't happen. They're, they're not a thing. Why would they come there? There's no incentive to operate. Uh, the first thing to say uh, is that they obviously do exist. Like, if you walk on the streets of Nairobi, for example, the, there's many branches of the Bank of China, there's branches of HSBC and all that kind of stuff. Uh, like, the, the Gates Foundation, for example, sets up a lot of farmers with mobile phones that allow them to make microtransactions with a lot of American banks. Like, this is empirically a thing. But structurally, the reason why this is likely to be true is threefold. Firstly, international institutions institutions are far more willing to take risk because they have large diverse portfolios and they have a lot of capital which means that they're happy to cop some kind of risk with these risky uh, lenders because you know obviously they can make them a lot of money speculatively. Secondly, uh, they, you, a lot of states usually use banks uh, uh, want, want to do a lot of infrastructural investment. So for example, China for its Belt and Road wants to invest in Kenya uh, and they use the banks as a medium to do that infrastructure because you know you need to set up a bank first so they can loan to businesses in order to build that infrastructure so you need a bank there like that bank has to exist and thirdly uh, they obviously also want to engage in the transaction market so a lot of for example subsistence farmers are now entering the commercial market they want to buy and sell things online they want to buy and sell things generally and to do that they need things like a credit card and obviously uh, you know every time people tap on something Alipay can charge you a percentage or Visa can charge you a percentage and that is a super super lucrative market of opportunity so that is why those banks uh, exist the second response is well they're bad because of exploitation and all that kind of stuff the first thing to say is that obviously there's very strong competition between international actors. There's a lot of different international banks from different states that want to engage in this business, which means they compete to offer the lowest interest rate. Compare that to domestic banks, which because they're hard to set up in these countries and are super nascent, usually there's only one or two banks at most within these states. And these states are, are usually state captured and highly corrupt anyway. And as they explained, states are systematic reliably or rely on them, which means if they just like price hike and do monopoly pricing, like no one can keep them accountable because if there's a bank run, the state is the one that has to pay. But also, as I explained in my introduction, they don't want to exploit these people because there's no point scamming someone of their slum because the slum is worth nothing. So that is the stuff on international banks. I'll give you a last say on international banks. Yeah.
Oh. Microfinance seeks to indenture servitude such that one can barely repay just the interest. So because they face low risk when they can just seize property, don't they offer very risky loans in order to ensure that people just repay interest? Uh, so I've yet to microfinance out, so two things to say here. The first thing to say is you don't stop people from engaging in microfinance because of where microfinance institutions are highly exploitative, people don't want to go to them when they can go to a formal institution where they can borrow money. They only go to microfinance in the first place when they have no capital and no history of credit, which means no formal institution on either side, whether it's a bank or an international bank, will want to do business with them, which means if they want to get that sewing machine, only the shady NGO that you talk about is the one that is willing to give them that money. So you get no delta in that instance. But the second thing to say is that we think a lot of microfinance institutions are largely good for the simple reason that microfinance tends to be unprofitable, which means that you need actors with altruistic uh, uh, incentives to enter that market. That's why largely microfinance institutions are NGOs and non-profits. Yes, there are shady microfinance institutions. They're able to take advantage of the financial obfuscation of COVID. This is not a thing that usually happens, but also the incentive of them to operate and for people to actually take on those loans is very low because their charities and the NGOs and the non-profits exist, which means that they compete against the shady microfinance loans. So maybe there's a short run harm there, but as microfinance develops more and more, the competition becomes more apparent. Lastly, on informal lending. Informal lending, community lending, is very, very big in a lot of developing countries, but is a double-edged sword. It's very good because obviously if you can't get money from a bank or a microfinance institution, uh, you can get it from your friends or your village elder. And it's obviously very flexible because you can negotiate terms more flexibly with your village elder compared to like a contract or something like that. But they're also really, really often harmful. Uh, and, and, and oh, sorry, the other good thing is that you can often access them when you can't access banks because you live in rural or regional areas without infrastructure. But they're often also bad because like, uh, you, uh, because like, you know, like uh, for the reason that like there are informal forms of enforcement that are often really bad because a lot of these loans have very low confidence. And we explained that we can use some of that fiat to invest in those informal forms of lending. That's really good because people have cultures of distrust of financial institutions. People often have zero credit history, they're subsistence farmers, they can't engage in the kind of mechanisms they talk about. We get better outcomes for them, safer outcomes for them. Very proud to the folks. <laughs>
your government tells you to invest heavily in its domestic institutions is far more easily overcome than if, and say, for instance, if they advise you to, in to invest in a large international, inst in international institution which you're likely to trust far less. To the extent that tr the trust is a bit iffy on either side, it is obviously far better if, it, if, like, if a government uh, throws its weight behind your domestic institutions that are more likely to have branches in your area than more likely for you to be able to access. The second thing that I note about individuals is I think a far more impactful counterfactual for the majority of individuals, including in the areas where people don't act with uh, microfinance, with NGOs, don't operate or operate far, uh, operate far less, is that these kind of is shadow banking and informal economies are like not just a little bit bad in the way that uh, open opposition uh, open opposition suggests. They are like in like incredibly criminogenic. People keep large amounts of cash around. They steal from it. Like they in like increase that level of crime there. And they're also also often like terrible socially, terrible to lower, co lower costs. For instance, there are many costs in India that uh, no, will, no one will lend to even informally. People will often charge women for higher interest rates. All of the kind of social harms are like are more easily addressed when people have a regular access to a domestic institution where they can make deposits as well as as well as, well as borrow there. So I think that kind of it, that that kind of counterfactual is obviously terrible for inter individuals. Clearly the government's going to explain why that's better. Let's secondly talk about access to infrastructure loans. And yeah, because this is not just a debate, a debate about foreign direct investment. The reason this is more important than foreign direct investment is a few fold. First is that it is often the precursor to foreign direct investment. Like you have to build the roads and the uh, like and the infrastructure and the networks before you can even access it. It is the government specifically taking on a responsibility, which is why its domestic economy is uh, like is so important. And the the kind of institutions that give uh, that give uh, things like development loans and infrastructure loans, those kind of things, have a far lower appetite for risk than investors because the, the amount of profit they can make on that is just so much higher. A couple of premises then. The first is to say that enormous quantities, uh, like just in dollar amounts or in rupee amounts or in rupiah amounts, of these countries' economy, economies are totally shadowy and informal. There are billions of rupees in stuffed in people's bedrooms in India that cause, uh, that cause monetary crises all the time. So only 60 million people in that country are formally and tra like and traceably employed. The rest is all informal, all, ca all cash in hand is incredibly difficult to track. The second is these countries need very large development loans because one, they are starting from like total sc scratch in many instances. Right. Second, they need to do it quite quickly because the acute effects of, po of poverty, the chronic lack of infra uh, infrastructure are harming people now and to creating negative externalities they're incredibly difficult to deal with. Thirdly, they have often a rapidly expanding population, especially in, popula in, uh, in population centers and increasing economic complexity and like different things that they have to do to compete. I would note that many developing countries have to try to race to roll out 5G networks because they know that will make them very competitive. Lastly, the competition for things like foreign direct, uh, like foreign direct investment or participation in the global economy between developing countries is very strong. So uh, like they're under quite a lot of pressure there. Third premise here is that those loans come from international orga uh, organizations like Bretton Woods institutions like, uh, and like those kind of regional development banks who fleece these countries with, uh, with, with interest rates or fleece them with the amount of uh, money that they're actually able to borrow in ways that are really harmful to them. How does this improve when we have greater participation in, uh, in, in domestic institutions? The first is you can prove the size, the precise size of your economy to a far greater extent oh, because oh, currently you cannot prove the amount, of, the amount of productivity and spending that is going on in your economy, the amount of borrowing, the amount of depositing, like those metrics do not exist and they're because people do participate in banking. But they do not exist anywhere near the real amount that, and that is the level of economic productivity that would allow you to guarantee that you would be able to pay back the loan. Guarantee a certain degree of economic growth in the future makes that loan worthwhile and justifiable. Second, you prove oh. banking in inclusion, uh, which does just, that's about proving your productivity now, that you, but banking inclusion does dramatically improve productivity. You're, allowed, you can, you're able to receive things like remittances as far as you you give people wage protection and consumer protection. That does meaningful, and meaningfully improve, like improve the amount of people who are in formal employment, who are in formal employment or who are actually actually accessing those financial services there. And the reason that uh, like banking overall inclusion is likely to be good, is likely to improve is that countries in these circumstances, yes, will do things like insure, will do things that, so, that cost some money, but like increasing education about the importance of putting your money in a bank instead of under your mattress is something that doesn't cost as much and that they would want to, uh, want to do anyway. Lastly though, you don't have currency or currency constantly having a huge value fluctuation when medium level, medium level and large enterprise as that do exist domestically, sell off enormous amounts of rupees all at once so that they can access the US dollar so that they can engage more in the international institutions that they necessarily have to, which is what makes it go up and down. So you have more stable currency in the future, you can put the size of your economy are uh, closing. So, um, if some people are so distrusted by society as we say that they can't access microfinance, why would domestic banks run by the governments that hate them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people don't trust banks under the status quo and therefore no one can do anything with POI. The reason that you can do this is the reason that I described. These are not macrofinance institutions from overseas, they're not banks from overseas. These are your like your banks that you can actually identify in your country, maybe that you've even used before or identified before in some ca in some capacity. These are more likely to start up in regional areas because the cost for them, for them moving into a regional area, the sub cost, the opportunity cost is much lower. They're more likely to actually reach more people and be able to do that outreach really well. 
belt they are people from your from your country, obviously much better. Last thing that on why it allows you to control your interest rates, a couple of premises here. First is say that the main way that central banks control the consumer-facing interest rates and actually have an impact on people's behavior in economies is by changing the interest rates that banks pay to transfer money between each other when they need to. So Westpac needs, ba needs money from Combank because Combank has money that they can that, that Westpac can then lend out. The interest rate on that transaction is controlled by the central bank of that uh, of that country and the, by and the, like and the overnight cash rate and that, the way that, that transaction occurs. And second, in order to do, in order to actually meaningfully control banks' interest rates via that mechanism, you need to uh, like actually have meaningful amounts of money being transferred between domestic consumer like commercial banks. Like the, so, those banks need to be lending, so need to actually need but to borrow money between each other. They need to have the money to borrow out between each other, and they need to be doing that fairly frequently. This is really important because being able to control your interest rate is how you conduct economic stimulus for people to spend and borrow and buy more. It's also how you control inflation if you want people to do that less. You can't do that one with international banks, which is why I always get because why would they help you? They're probably not even transacting in your currency in the majority of instances. And secondly, you can't do that if a bunch of people do not borrow at all, which is explained by OG instead of the water. So at the end of this, is obviously a much better thing for these developing countries. Informal systems and banking are destroying some of the most productive, well, actually some of the most productive places in the world. Incredibly proud to cover. medium enterprises are making large capital investments when they are leveraging themselves highly, when they are making, like, spending incredible, when they are leveraging themselves highly, having that done within the same, within the same banking institutions to which your domestic banking sector takes, or in your, like, personal banking sector takes place, exposes your populace to an unacceptable level of risk, and also exposes your, it also further exposes your, your economy, your, further exposes your economy to a real and perceived risk that it, is, that it is liable to that it is liable that it is liable to poor outcomes. That makes FDI far less likely. That makes um, that makes uh, development far less. First things in the speech. Why does this necessarily entrench monopolies? Why is that bad? Why is diversity within the banking sector a good thing? Firstly, because we know that here under the under the yeah, counterfactual, domestic banks are likely to exist for reasons such as that they have simply more likely to carry excess currency reserves in that particular country because they simply already do exist under the status quo. We think they are likely to exist like alongside of these. However, however, when you provide like un, un, when you provide this potential, when you provide these like when you do not provide mechanisms by when you provide mechanisms that mean that these ha banks have an unfair advantage, you are far more likely to not see foreign banks come into these countries. Has been relatively uncontested. Today. What's the issue here? A few things. Firstly, that means that when you provide this kind of competitive advantage, you raise the likelihood of these banks becoming politically entrenched. Our opening covers that, but they also you also raise the likelihood of them becoming, for instance, too big to fail, too dependent upon the economy. We're likely to see these banks. Um, we're likely to see also these banks become politically entrenched to the extent to which it is incredibly difficult to set up other domestic banks. We're very unlikely to see that because of that political entrenchment of power. You're likely to create a there's likely to create an unfair favorable regulatory environment to create other more diverse domestic banks. We also know there's often a great deal of startup cost to be able to start one of these banks. It's difficult to access those situa uh, doesn't access the situations. That's why we see the status quo where in a lot of these developing countries there is only a few domestic loan providers. We also know here that under here 
competition is just like good in the first instance, right? Like it actually is able to stop a great deal of the like neg of, of the like negative exploitative practices. We note that for like a large amount of like the urbanized populations of developing countries, they do actually have choice about which banks they go to. They are actually able to therefore like market select into better banks. We are able to add market select into better banks, but that development tends to flow outwards. Next year, why is that why next year, why is having that why is having those differences better? We know the kinds of loans that are going, we know that the, the kinds of services that these different kinds of banks are likely to provide. We say these domestic banks often provide, we, these, know these domestic banks are often providing like day-to-day -day banking services, they're often providing personal loans. These foreign banks are likely to come in in search of like larger capital investment projects. They're probably likely to provide capital, for instance, to like small, medium enterprises that looks like things like infrastructure investment, but it also looks, it also looks like things like large infrastructure investments. Why is there an issue here? Because these kinds of investments are just simply incredibly high risk, particularly in the context of developing countries. They're often likely to face things like political disruptions when you have a change in government, when you simply have external factors, you have natural disasters, all sorts of things. We also know that these kinds of regulations, by necessity, like make these investments like higher, like make you more likely to engage in risky investments, right? Because you're making the loan conditions artificially fa more, more favorable. That means that you're far more likely to leverage yourself to a far greater extent that that bank actually necessarily has the capacity to fall back necessarily actually has the capacity to fall back on what is the harm here right speaker because for a few things first is to say that that first is to say that in some instances those things will occur you will lose out on the, you, those things will occur and then you will simply lose out on that money what is the harm uh, you simply will lose that money what is the harm here first what is the harm here uh, firstly <laughs> firstly um Firstly, that is to say, when this happens and your populace is therefore no longer able to just like go to the ATM and withdraw money, that obviously has incredibly catastrophic imp like catastrophic occurrences. Like it's obviously incredibly catastrophic for those individuals. They're not able to access their money. It often results in political crises occurring in these countries. That looks like things like the complete like 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 catastrophes for these banking sectors, and also for an incredibly like large perception in terms of the stability of these countries. It often results precipitates political crises and things like that. What is the issue here? That means that that environment is then seen as incredibly risky for further investment. It is also seen that that environment is also seen as incredibly antagonistic towards the investment. Yeah, I'll take a third of India's population have like not ever accessed a bank. They are fully unbanked. Don't you think that more meaningfully reduces that commercial bank competition than like encouraging people to use banks? So I don't think, I think that obviously like if you are like, I think that like, to an extent that like development occurs in these countries, right? Like I think that to a large extent, like naturally those banks tend to float outwards, right? Like they tend to go into those areas as areas tend to urbanize, as populations tend to do so. We think that also, we, we just think like that that probably is like a self-solving problem to some extent. Why does this necessarily hinder development? Because firstly, the environment is just seen as like unfriendly to foreign, unfriendly to investment and unfriendly to these infrastructures. Because we know often often these company, often companies are incredibly unlikely to want to go into these countries and then borrow from uh, and then and then borrow from these like domestic lenders, right? They're likely to want to be relying on external capital. That means a few things. That means that they're unfairly no longer having access. They're no longer having like access to these more favorable conditions. That means that they have a competitive disadvantage to, I mean, they have a competitive disadvantage in these markets. That means a few things. Firstly, it means that you no longer are able to leverage the like short-term profitability returns that often CEOs and boards are looking for when they're looking to justify investing in that particular country. It also means that your country is just perceived as being mean, as being unfair to foreign direct investment. That perception is incredibly important insofar as if you are untrusting of the government as a foreign company, you are far less likely to invest in it further like invest in it further and we also note that often companies will invest in relatively small projects projects that are able to be crowded out by local competition that is able to access more favorable banking co conditions as a mechanism by which of testing the waters to say that this cut is a mechanism like is a place by which we're able to be able like by mechanism by which we're able to engage by via which we're able to like gain profitability out of these particular countries what like out of these particular countries next year why are these banks also why are these foreign banks necessarily more easily regulated and that why that brings benefits to the banking sector as a whole for a few reasons firstly because of international oversight as said by our opening but we would also know that the norms and information from these banks tends to also like precipitate through the banking sector that looks like things like when you're staffing your central bank you generally do that from people who have worked with the banking sector within your country that looks like that means that when you don't make this that means that when you have, you are incredibly unlikely to like put people in positions of power within your central bank and have not worked within your country's banking sector. Having people who have experience within that system means you're more likely to get those people in your central banks. Why is that so important? That creates that creates um 
norms and movements toward that creates norms and movements towards greater regulations in these in, in, in these particular situations. That moves towards overall having a, a perception of lower risk and a lower risk in the way that these investments are carried out as all. Well. That therefore further encourages the capacity to invest in this country. So proud to affirm. <laughs> Op member for that speech, I now invite uh, Gov Whip to conclude the Gov Bench. Here, here. very simple ideas. Maybe a topic labeled economics should be about economics, not personal finance. And second, maybe we should be realistic about the sets of people to take on these rules. I can quote for opening half teams and talk about most rural, most disadvantaged actor ever, who might get a microfinance loan or something like that. Neither team really concretely prove either what this, this person is taking a loan for or why the motion would increase this. Like literally the only example provided by anyone in the opening half for, for why someone who is this poor might take on a loan is David in about seven minutes uh, <laughs> saying sewing machines. Just the word. That is the only <laughs> example this opening half team explains. Which means it's much more realistic when the closing half team talks about things like small businesses taking up loans, people that are otherwise scared of banks, and now it is the campaign that's provided by the government here to explain why banking is a good idea and something you can try. That probably does actually explain there's a delta in this debate and set of people that make their decision changes. First thing I'm going to do after that introduction uh, is uh, rebut CG, a CEO rather, and their four extensions. Then I'm going to talk about our extensions and why they're just clearly the most important thing in the debate. Then I'll respond to Owo. First extension that CEO Wait. provides here is to explain that domestic markets are likely to be monopolies. Uh, I will just concede this for efficiencies, but this obviously improves in a world where we are the team that explains that more people opt into banking. Connor's Indian example here explains by far more people swelling into this market probably means it's profitable for more banks to upstart, but more importantly, probably just means that the current banks are likely to be pretty overwhelmed to provide a, at least initially a somewhat poor quality of service, which means that other banks will have an incentive to try and undercut them and provide better services. So the problem that the CEO uh, explains is true, but one that is resolved by the second claim they make here is that, uh, that, that large banks will take on, uh, sorry, large businesses will take on very large loans because of this policy, which will kind of like lead to a contagion problem in domestic economies. I think there's a couple of problems with this. The first is, is I don't know why this actor changes its incentives based off the debate, so this argument is the only part of CO's extension that falls into the trap I just identified, of not actually explaining why the motion changes actors' incentives. But more importantly, these, country, these businesses are likely to already be taking loans from international banks because they're so large, they're already likely to be getting a fair bit of uh, to, uh, stimulus from, say, the government to build, say, a new factory or something like that. So I don't think they're taking so much money that, like, the entire Indian economy has, like, all its money withdrawn from ATMs to, like, furthest, like, two factories being built or something like this. Like, this seems a bit silly and unrealistic, and I don't think a problem. But most importantly, this is, just sounds like the government is doing the particular policy of this motion really badly to encourage these people, rather than, again, in our first extension, the same people are likely to change their behaviour to most people that don't bank uh, at all because they think banks are kind of scary. The final part of this uh, CG, CO extension is to explain that FDI will be now less, they will be disadvantaged because they can't take on domestic bank loans, which are better, which means that FDI will be less profitable, which means they won't come to this country. The problem with this extension is, again, it is smart, which is a total knife of their opening, because the opening says domestic banks are bad, international banks are good, CO says domestic banks are good, uh, and international banks are bad, so that's just a knife. That argument then doesn't count. Okay, let's talk about our extensions and why they're the most important thing in the debate. The first thing we identify here is that these countries don't just like kind of develop themselves out of nowhere. They don't develop themselves because of sewing machines and people building plows. They develop themselves and draw people out of poverty, draw people into hospitals and schools when you have investment in those countries. 
uniquely, we explain that that currently occurs in the status quo, not by like individuals taking bank loans or even governments taking loans from private uh, international banks, but they do so by taking loans from development banks, things like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, whatever China's one is, Dan, uh, Dan, David could probably tell me the name of that, I've forgotten right now. Um, <laughs> It is in those contexts which the loans that people get are either do not exist or are very, very punitive and have very high interest rates for the reasons and mechanisms Connor explains. That these people are incapable of proving to these banks that they actually have good abilities to repay those loans. Because they have poor history of doing so and they have incredibly poor knowledge about their own economy. They don't know how much money is going through it. They don't know how much savings people have. They don't know how strong the economy is because they simply do not see most of that money. Because most of that money is cash in hand that is exchanged from person to person. You have no way of tracking that on the massive scale that occurs in an economy, especially in particularly large economies like, say, India, which has huge, which is incredibly rich but incredibly informal economies. And it's in this context, then, when we encourage people to do their everyday buying and selling and putting their wages in a bank, that now those banks have that data. And that data is then usable to explain how well your economy is going, which means you're able to explain to the World Bank, the IMF, you do have an ability to repay that loan. So either you get a loan in the first place, which means you build roads and hospitals. You get a bigger loan, which means you build an additional hospital. Or you do so with far lower interest rates, which means you actually pay off that loan, which means you get another loan later, build more roads and hospitals, or you're simply able to just do other things already. So that is already just wipes out the opening half. Because if this team wants to talk about some people being punitively punished by poor interest rates, then their ability to have a job because that country develops, the ability to be healthy because that's, that our country has a hospital or a school, is a far higher order impact in this debate and outweighs them. And even if these teams are able to prove FDI, Connor also explains why that is like logically prior, sorry, logically after what we prove here. Because obviously you don't have an incentive to bring your business into a country, you can't drive to the factory, you can't do so efficiently we don't have railroads, we don't have workers that are healthy and well-informed company. Communities already collectivize their money and engage in community lending to access things like farming machines and counter proposals. Isn't it far better to just empower those programs, turn them into programs? Okay, this is this is this is, this as far as I can tell largely new. Like Jordan yeah, does talk about like village chiefs, but doesn't explain why they would centralize to provide this. So that's a new explanation. But to be more generous, I don't know what the benefit of having an international bank coming in and telling you what to do, like, and explain how to do this. Like, even if we're generous here, this does not, like, I, you don't actually provide specifics of why this is particularly useful, even if it is particularly useful, just far less important. So I suppose that POI is probably just trying to be OG, not us, so frankly, I don't really care about it. Second explanation we explain to provide why we're able to help these economies develop is we explain they have far greater control over interest rates. Because interest rates are the key tool that countries, so the first argument is around fiscal policy and the second is about monetary policy, right, for basic econ notes. That here is that we're explaining why we can control our economy and stimulate it far better. And we're able to control interest rates because now most of the, the money that goes around in the economy is actually subject to things like overnight cash rates, which is how central banks develop their interest rates and force commercial banks to keep to those rates because it's not profitable to exchange a bunch of money from your bank to another bank if the interest rate the central bank is charging you is higher than the amount of money you're actually transacting in that case. So you actually are able to control interest rates, which means you're able to clamp down, so increase interest rates when inflationary periods come on, but more importantly, you're able to lower interest rates and incentivize people to build a new like, a factory equipment that all cares so much about to increase productivity in this context. If you're able to actually spend that money, if you're actually able to control how much of it goes on in this debate. Do not get sucked into the personal finance clash of the opening half. This debate is about economics. We fix and help developing countries very practically. I thank Gov Whip for that speech. I invite Gov Whip to conclude the debate. Here, here. Uh, and can I just confirm, were you happy to be recorded or um, would you rather not?